Neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to change the wiring within itself, to change how it actually is lined up so that you have thoughts more often or less often, or the more intense thoughts or less intense thoughts. Let's learn a little about that in an attempt to re-enfranchise people with the driver's seat of their own life. This is an example of a neuron and a dendrite coming to link up. When they do, there's a gluon, a chemical released between them, which strengthens the bond. So the more you drive that highway, let's say, use that analogy, the stronger it gets. Highways that are frequently used are repaired and lengthened and strengthened, while highways that fall into disuse are, or disrepair because of, of look, lack of use are pruned away. And both those things are happening in the, in the neurological highways of our brains. And anyone needs to realize that and enfranchise themselves that they have control to some degree over their thoughts or to a more accurate degree. You can have any thought enter your head, but you can control the ones you ruminate on. Um, as people in recovery have a very hard time with this, it's more important for them to try and reclaim control as it is important for anyone to understand this new science of neuroplasticity and specifically self-directed neuroplasticity where you use your thoughts, you select which thoughts you're going to have more often so that you control the mapping of your brain and future thoughts will all line up with the mapping that you've endeavored to change. In scans of addicts. Also, when they show neurons firing together and wiring together in real time, what are we seeing there? So, retaking the driver's seat and altering neural pathways. As usual, you're a profound guy. You're going <laughs> after depth and breadth, you know, at the same time. So, um, there are many mechanisms whereby we can hardwire happiness into ourselves, as well as hardwire resilience, uh, loving kindness, all the good stuff we want to insight, wisdom, practical skills, you know, like getting more skillful at running a meeting at work or more comfortable with public speaking. You know, there are many different pathways. Some of them involve sensitizing existing connections between neurons like synapses. Some of those mechanisms involve uh, changes in the expression of genes inside. Okay. Other mechanisms involve the building of new connections, new synapses. Other mechanisms involve changes in the release of neurotransmitter patterns or their concentrations in the cerebrospinal fluid. Okay. You know, other mechanisms involve bringing more blood to busy regions, you know, muscles you're using a lot, so they have more blood and supplies so they can do their work. A right. lot of great mechanisms. And the takeaway point, I think, really does boil down to this fundamental idea of, you know, just like the old line, you are what you eat. Well, right. what I would really say, you are what you pay attention to. Right. You know, and particularly what you are um, immersed in. So if you're aware of your suffering or pain, that alone is not reinforcing it. If you are holding it in spacious awareness, if you're stepping back from it, if, right, you're, watching, right. if you're exploring it, you're not reinforcing it. Actually, you're linking it mm -hmm. to that, you know, witnessing detached, calmer place. That's good. The where trouble begins is when we get hijacked by it, when we believe it, when we mm -hmm. fuel it, when we chase it when we ruminate about it. Then you're doing laps around the track in hell, yeah. deepening the track every time you go around it. Flip the other way, if you get immersed in a beneficial experience, usually a mild one, often a subtle one, like, oh yeah, flowers are blooming, birds yeah. are chirping, you know, no bombs are going off in my piece of parlor today. Yeah, you know, that's right. Plane safely landed. Uh, my friend really does care about me. You know, yeah, he's kind of a jerk sometimes, but he really does care about me or something like that. You know, immerse yourself in that experience to work the machinery of your brain to hardwire that into yourself. You can really do that. To do that, though, just like you said, you got to get in the driver's seat. Yeah. If you're in the, I've been a therapist and a teacher a long time. 
I started meditating in 1974. I started leading personal growth groups, you know, when I was like 18 years old. You know, I was, I've been at it a long time. And I'm 63 right now. And the point I, about all that, I've become, I think, nicer, kinder, more compassionate. I've also become tougher, more serious. Yeah. Like, you know, at the end of the day, uh, only you can change your brain from the inside out. Sure, yeah. Only you. All kinds of other people are trying to change it, including media, politicians, your, you know, your, your ex, whatever. They're trying to change it from the outside in. You got to take charge of that process yourself, and no one but you can do it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do some chalkboard or blackboard learning here about neuroplasticity, self-directed neuroplasticity from Khan Academy. Meaning that each individual action potential will start to elicit a larger response in the target cell. One change that can occur is that for each action potential reaching the axon terminal, more neurotransmitter may be released into the synapse so that a bigger response is gonna be seen in the target cell because more neurotransmitter is released from the axon terminal with each action potential coming down the axon. Or the change may occur on the postsynaptic membrane. There may be an increase in the number of neurotransmitter receptors in the postsynaptic membrane or changes to the types of neurotransmitter receptors or the responses that occur through second messengers so that for any given amount of neurotransmitter that's released from the axon terminal from one action potential, a bigger response is seen in the target cell just because it's much more sensitive to the neurotransmitter that's being released. Either or of these changes from the axon terminal releasing more neurotransmitter or the postsynaptic membrane becoming more responsive, we're gonna see an increased response in the target cell per action potential that's reaching the axon terminal. So that would be synaptic potentiation. Now there's a lot of research going on trying to understand how these changes occur because it seems like there's communication going both directions from both the axon terminal to the postsynaptic membrane as well as backwards and all the processes for how this is happening have not been worked out yet. But now let's consider the opposite. Let's consider synaptic depression. So let's say I draw a little line here to represent time and let's say we're very, having very few action potentials, just the occasional action potential. I'll just show this little spike here. And we're just not having much activity. We're not having many action potentials reach this axon terminal. So basically the opposite responses that can happen with synaptic potentiation, with synaptic depression, we may see that the amount of neurotransmitter released from the axon terminal decreases per action potential so that for each action potential less neurotransmitter is released into the synaptic cleft therefore there'll be less of a response in the target cell and or we could see that the neurotransmitter receptors may decrease in number so that maybe we had more neurotransmitter receptors to begin with and that some of those go away so we have a smaller number of receptors or changes to the receptors to some less responsive kind of receptor or changes to second messengers so that the target cell just doesn't respond as much to any given amount of neurotransmitter. So with either of these changes, we'd see less of a response in the target cell to an action potential reaching the axon terminal. Now, in addition to these changes at the level of individual synapses with synaptic neuroplasticity, we can also see changes in the total number of synapses between a neuron and its target cell that we can call structural neuroplasticity. So for example, let's consider a couple of chains of neurons. So let me draw couple of neurons in a chain for each each of these examples, the potentiation and the depression. And let's say they start out looking pretty similar. They, they um, both have about the same amount of dendritic branches and the length of their dendrites are about the same. I'll just leave the dendrites off this one. And we'll say that we have about the same number of axon terminals coming out and forming synapses between this neuron and this other neuron, which will be its target cell in this situation. Now I'll just draw a little axon in the target neuron as well. 
So if these two neurons are firing together frequently, if this neuron is firing lots of action potentials and this neuron is firing lots of action potentials in response to this neuron stimulating it, we can see an increase in the number of synapses between these two. And we can see that from the dendrites. We can see the dendrites getting longer or growing more branches, so they become more, more complex trees of dendrites. Or we could see that from this presynaptic neuron, it could start sprouting more axon branches and terminals so that it's forming more synaptic connections with the, with the dendritic tree over here. So with this kind of structural potentiation, both of these neurons are sprouting lots more little branches. They're either sprouting axon terminals or sprouting more dendritic branches. So I'll just write that down here, that we're doing lots of sprouting just like uh, plants may sprout lots of new shoots in the spring. And then the opposite may occur here. If we're not having very many action potentials being fired by this neuron or by this neuron, and particularly if they're not firing action potentials together, we can see the opposite, where we actually start losing length of dendrites or losing dendrite branches, and the dendritic tree can become simpler and shorter. Or we may start losing axon terminals. We may simplify the axon terminals that are coming out of the axon. And if this, if this neuron is not firing very often at all, we may actually lose this neuron. It may actually go away. And this type of structural depression, where we're actually losing parts of neurons or entire neurons because they're not very active, we call pruning Again, just kind of like plants, if you're kind of pruning pieces off a plant so that it has less twigs or branches, it's the same idea. Now, both potentiation and depression can happen over a wide spectrum of time. And we often kind of divvy it up into short-term changes, such as on the order of seconds or minutes, or long-term changes that can be months, years, or even decades. And synaptic neuroplasticity can contribute to both short-term and long-term potentiation or depression. And then these structural changes tend to go along with more long-term potentiation or depression. And I think you could imagine how by changing the strength of information flow through individual synapses or between cells by changing the total number of synapses that there are, that neuroplasticity can play a very important role in development of the nervous system as it's wiring itself together based on the experience that the nervous system is receiving during its formative time. And also this plays a huge role in memory and learning and recovery from injury to the nervous system when it's kind of trying to wire itself back together after it's been injured. So these are a few of the things we, we know about neuroplasticity, but there's a lot more that we don't understand yet. And there's still a lot of research going on trying to understand how all these processes happen and how they contribute to all these amazing functions of the nervous system that can change over time. Dr. Rick Hansen is going to suggest to us that your brain is yours for your lived experience and you need to be good to it and treat yourself with an iota of respect. Be a sports commentator for the home team, if you will. He uses a different analogy. Right. right. Other nice analogies are, um, you know, it's like your brain is a puppy. You know, right. it does bad stuff sometimes, right. but you don't. You don't beat it. You oh, don't right. back on it. You, you never forget also how cute and lovable it is. And that it's kind of, you know, it's it's designed to be like that in a lot of ways. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What we're trying to do is generally guide it to a better, in a, in a better direction. And to go back to your point earlier, there is, even in neuroscience being a baby science, there is a lot of evidence these days that the gradual accumulation of personal practice you know, getting in your own driver's seat one day at a time, one minute at a time, 
Um, we're going to finish soon, and I'll, I'll offer a couple of quotes here about minutes. That yeah, are really, okay, great. Really, yeah, really let's powerful. do that. Um, but you can have a lot of confidence, like literally within minutes, you can see new neurons. You can see new synapse, new connections being forged between neurons, right. literally within minutes, right. within seconds, within tenths of seconds. You can start seeing changes in the firing patterns, the functional functional changes in the nervous system, even without even before you start seeing structural changes, you know, change is real. People can have real confidence um, in that, in their practice adding up, and that they can really make changes in themselves over time. My own personal opinion is that if people are really seriously practicing with the mind and they still feel depressed, or there's still something that just, or they're real still anxious, or they're still real PTSD ish, I think it's always good to optimize the hardware. And there's a range of options. I think medication is at the end of that range of possible skillful means. But to think in terms of, you know, if you are really working the mind and you keep hitting a ceiling, you know, in terms of how high you can go yeah. in, in healing or recovery, start looking at, you know, just be smart about it. Be open-minded yeah. about it. Be pragmatic about it. Work with smart people who are not one-size-fits-all fits all kind of people. Yeah. You know, I just want to say that piece. To finish on this idea of a minute, all right? Okay. There's a saying in Tibet, if you take care of the minutes, the years will take care of themselves. Right. And you can find versions of that saying in other cultures. I love that saying. Yeah. I don't know about the year. I don't know about the years, let alone even the hours, you know, but the minutes I can handle. What's yeah. the next minute? And I ask myself also, what's the most important minute of your life? I think it's the next one. Yeah. Minute after minute after minute. You cannot do anything about the minutes of the past. More than a few minutes in the future, your influence is starting to wane. Even in this moment of now, it already is whatever it is. You can't do anything about it. But yeah. with the minute you're leaning into, you can influence and shape. I think that's the most important minute of your life. I agree. So what will you do with the most important minute of your life? Minute after minute after minute. Mm -hmm. And my suggestion is at least a few minutes a day, take in the good in that minute. Take in whatever is useful, wise, healing, reassuring, relieving, rewarding, wholesome in that minute. Why waste it on your brain? Why leave all that money lying on the table? Yeah. Take it into yourself. Take you know? it in. Let and, it pave the pathway. Yeah. Of and don't them. underestimate the power of those little minutes or yeah. those little five seconds, the, the, the duration of a single breath or yeah. even a single inhalation or exhalation to stay with the experience. There's a saying, think not lightly of good, saying it will not come to me. Drop by drop is the water pot filled. Likewise, the wise one gathers it little by little, filling oneself with good. Rick Hansen, beauty.